Thank you very much. Arigato. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Peter, for that, uh, for that introduction. Vancouver Port, as you may know, is the busiest port in Canada, growing very fast, and growing because in my province, in British Columbia, we have made trade with Asia our priority. In British Columbia, we are the only province where almost 50% of our trade goes to Asia. Many provinces in Canada depend mostly on the United States. We have been purposeful in making friends and creating new relationships across the Pacific because we understand that this is where the future of the world economy sits. Thank you very much, Ron, for the introduction as well. Acting Ambassador uh, Paget from the Canadian Embassy, merci bien, and also to your staff who have been enormously helpful in making this trade mission work for our, our team, all of our delegates. Thank you very much for that help. And of course, Ben Stewart, who is British Columbia's special representative at the political level here in Asia. The first time we've had such a representative. Uh, ben is a former cabinet colleague of mine. And if you ever have any, Ben, stand up for a second. Um, if you ever, yes, he deserves a hand. Um, he, uh, he's, he's certainly someone you should speak to. So thank you. It is a great honor to be here today with the Canada Chamber Council in Tokyo. As you know, some of you may know, we just held the Japan Canada Chamber Council in Vancouver in March, strengthening our ties in both, in both directions because trade, like marriage, can never be a one-way relationship. The benefits need to happen on both sides and both sides of the Pacific. Um, uh, I, hear, I see here an old friend, Kazko, who is one of, the, one of Japan's uh, great representatives in British Columbia, um, uh, a, a property developer and also a brewery owner in our province, and a great ambassador on behalf of, of uh, Japan and British Columbia, the unofficial uh, J Japanese ambassador in BC. Would you stand up, Kazko Komatsu? This is, uh, this is my third visit to Tokyo um, since I became Premier, and or Tokyo or, and Japan. I've also visited Kyoto, other cities in this country, N because I understand how important relationships are. My, I'm carrying on a tradition that my grandfather started in our family when he visited on a trade mission over 60 years ago from Vancouver. Um, he was born to a very poor family uh, his, his father, my great-grandfather, came from Scotland. My grandfather was born in a shack on the beach on the west coast of Vancouver Island, the closest that you can get to Japan in North America. <laughs> and he became a fisherman. And as a fisherman, through the 1920s and the 1930s, he worked shoulder to shoulder with all of the many Japanese Canadians who came to build the fishing industry on our side of the Pacific Ocean. And just like in Japan, as you know, our seas are unpredictable and very rough. In the 1920s and 30s, fishing was an especially perilous job. My father told me stories of how my grandfather's life was saved on numerous occasions on those high seas by his Japanese colleagues, and how equally he, he returned that favor to them. The beginning of a long relationship my family has had with Japan, and my father always reminded me, in some way, you should remember to be thankful to those men on the ship without whom your grandfather would not have survived, without whom you would not be here today. So on behalf of my grandfather to the people of Japan, arigato. <laughs> and so he was anxious, my grandfather, to renew the relationship that he had with Japan and the Japanese people after the interruption of the war and joined the very first trade mission from Vancouver to Japan in the early 1950s. And those are brief moments in my family life 
in, and in the long, long history of this great nation. But as we know, great change is something that, is on, that only happens in opportunities we find in brief moments. From the revolution to where you, the early revolution to where you stand today, this country has been a student of the world. This country, though, has also been a teacher of the world. You have taken ideas from around the world and made them better, generated ideas that lead the world, like quantum mathematics, and shared those with the world. And this is a pivotal time in Japan as you, as you revitalize your economy. And it is also a pivotal time for British Columbia. We are leading in Canada. We lead the country. We are doubling the country rate of national economic growth. We have the lowest unemployment rate in Canada. We enjoy the highest possible credit rating at AAA stable. And we have four balanced budgets, each one of them with a substantial surplus. We are at a moment where British Columbia has opportunities before it to work together with Japan as never before. And we are succeeding in our economic progress because we have controlled government spending, because we have focused on expanding our trade relationship very purposefully with Asia. And the BC delegation that is joining me here today, I hope you'll get the chance to meet as many of them as you can, are representing business, education, government, resource sector, technology, health sciences, and natural resources. So let me start with mining. Because for over 30 years, Japanese companies have played a crucial role in building British Columbia's exploration for mining projects. Projects that build communities and that keep people working. And one example is the Copper Mountain Mine. Uh, I visited that, uh, that community several weeks ago and met the families that depend on that investment from Japan in order to live the kinds of lives that they hope to live and the future they hope to build for their children. It's in the tiny town of Princeton, we celebrated Mining Week together, and we celebrated Mitsubishi Minerals' commitment to Princeton, to British Columbia, which owns 25% of that mine and buys almost all of what it produces. We have taken, in these difficult times for commodity prices, an extra effort as a government to support that mine and all mining in British Columbia. Because as you know, we have a state-owned utility that provides the energy in our province. We've allowed mining, uh, mining companies to defer their energy costs so that they can make it through these tough times without shutting their doors to maintain the, inv the certainty of investment for our friends overseas and to make sure that we preserve those jobs that are so vital to communities. Japan also has a huge stake in BC's clean natural gas and LNG industry. Japanese firms are partners in several of our largest projects, Mitsubishi in LNG Canada, Japex in the Pacific Northwest LNG, and I'm proud to say that Japan sent the largest delegation to the International LNG Conference in BC in 2015. On, but when it comes to natural gas, we all know that global conditions are significantly slowing LNG development. But we cannot be distracted by what's happening today. If Japan teaches the world anything, it is that visionary long-term thinking is what pays the bills for our future. 10 and even 20 years will be upon us in a very brief moment. Japan has only become the largest importer of LNG in the world through very purposeful work, through visionary future thinking. And here's what we know about the future. The demand for clean energy is only going to increase in Japan and also for your neighbors in Asia. 2.3 billion people will be joining the middle class by in the next 14 years. 2.3 billion people who will require energy and because of the steps the world is taking to fight climate change, who will require clean energy. And the high quality of our gas also presents immediate opportunities for LNG and for other products. Astomos is here with us today, a company that recognizes that potential. Just last week, Astomos announced its intention to purchase a 50% uh, of a propane export facility in Prince Rupert that will be developed by Alta Gas 
a $500 million project that is set to go ahead on a much faster timeline than the current LNG projects. And from natural gas to bioenergy developed by BC's innovation, innovative forestry sector, BC has what Japan needs in order to grow and in order to grow sustainably. Pacific Bioenergy reached a long-term agreement with a Japanese utility recently to supply wood pellets, and BC continues to be the largest supplier of wood pellets to Japan. We are all about resources in British Columbia, and Japanese uh, buyers, Japanese partners are well aware of that. It's been the bedrock of our relationship since my grandfather was fishing off our coast with his Japanese colleagues. But we are also becoming, around the world, a hub for technology. Our diverse economy and our natural resource economy is increasingly dependent on technology to ensure that, techno that our resources are the cleanest and most sustainably extracted anywhere in the world. And the tech sector overall, outside of resources, is playing a larger and larger role. We talked about opportunities for Japanese investors at the BC Tech Investment Seminar earlier today, and we talked about a few advantages. One of them is our strategic location. In the same time zone, the same language as California, and also with access to the NAFTA agreement. We have a competitive tax climate, certainly more competitive than California, and a culture of innovation. We have the lowest corporate taxes, combined corporate taxes in North America, and we have some of the lowest personal taxes as well. And that's why companies like Valhalla Games, who are here with us today, have announced they are building their global headquarters in Vancouver. And, but I know that tech is also about more than just a scientific exchange. Japan and British Columbia have to work together to make sure that we change the future. Hidetoshi Nishimori is the world-leading pioneer in quantum computing, the father of that thinking and all that it has produced around the world. He, and as along in leading, uh, as the intellectual leader of a BC company called D-Wave, is allowing us to develop what we hope will be one of the world's most successful companies. They're working with their Japanese partner, One Qubit. And that quantum computing product that they are now exporting to Google and NASA is one that we believe will change the world. I am not a, a mathematician, but here is my simple explanation of how it works. Regular computing, for those of you who aren't in this field, suggests that we solve a, pro a problem after problem after problem after problem incrementally in order to get over the top of the mountain. In quantum computing, they drill a hole through the bottom of the mountain. We get there a lot faster. But it's that thinking inspired by a great Japanese creative mind that has allowed this company to prosper. And now as D-Wave grows and creates new relationships back in Japan, we will grow together. We can turn science fiction into science fact, but behind every innovation, there is our most important resource. It is not copper, it is not gas, it is not lumber, it is not even a computer. Our greatest resource is people in both of our countries. And that's true in any advanced economy. And the future is transformed by people because we build relationships. From new agreements that bring teachers from Tokyo to Hiroshima for BC, uh, at, at, for, at Tokyo and Hiroshima to BC for training, student exchanges, growing tourism and people-to-people -people contact between our homes, to the tiniest BC blueberries that you can now buy in Tokyo 7-Elevens. Our relationship is growing stronger in, across every sector, every single day. And I hope very much that our two countries will continue to grow that relationship by making sure that we confirm the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is so vitally important for Canada's to, Canada to grow, as well as the Canada-Japan Economic Partner Agreement. Canada only grows because of trade. And while our American friends are talking about building walls and tearing up trade agreements, in Canada, we are very much committed to tearing down walls, to welcoming the world onto our shores, 
and to finding our way outside our country to exchange ideas and to build relationships. My grandfather used to teach me um, that the only thing that really gives our lives meaning is relationships and that the nature of those relationships must be respectful and they must be honest. And that, when we look back at our lives, will be the thing that we look at and measure ourselves by, the strength of our relationships. And it wasn't until I went to Kyoto for the first time that I really understood that perhaps my grandfather had learned the value of relationships from working with his Japanese colleagues on those fish boats in the 1920s and the 1930s. I sat with a Buddhist priest who explained to me the meaning of the phrase Ichigo Ichie, that every relationship matters, that each time we meet, we should treat it as though it was our last. And today, I thank you very much for coming, and I look forward to building a lasting, meaningful, respectful relationship together. Arigato.